Good morning, Colorado. You're listening to The Daily Sunup. The Daily Sunup podcast is a conversation with the Colorado Sun. See our trust indicators at coloradosun.com slash ethics. It's Wednesday, October 23rd. Today, there are less than two weeks until Election Day, and many Coloradans are dreading filling out their ballot because of how long and complicated it is. Don't worry, we're here to help. Political reporters Jesse Paul and Brian Eason break down how to get information on the judges on your ballot, as well as what each of the 14 statewide initiatives in Colorado this year would do. So grab your ballot and follow along. Before we begin, Experience Wild Things, the art of Marie Sendak, now on view at the Denver Art Museum. Discover drawings, paintings, posters, and other fun surprises created by one of America's most beloved storytellers and artists. Only at the Denver Art Museum for a limited time. Buy your tickets today at denverartmuseum.org. Now let's go back in time with some Colorado history. On this day in 2004, a groundbreaking ceremony was held for a replica of Fort Lupton, a historic fur trading post in southeastern Weld County. Originally established by Lieutenant Lancaster Lupton in 1836, after he resigned from the U.S. Army, the adobe fort was strategically located along the Trapper's Trail to trade with local tribes and American trappers. Lupton thrived in the fur business, exchanging goods for beaver and bison pelts. His success prompted the establishment of nearby forts, but the post closed in 1845 as the desire for furs declined. After a visit from a descendant in 1987 sparked interest, the replica was completed in 2011, serving as a historical site for the South Platte Valley Historical Society. Before we continue, for six decades, Colorado-based Terumo Blood and Cell Technologies has been working to unlock the healing power of blood and cells to provide tangible hope to patients. Want to make an impact? Find out how at terumobct.com slash hope. Again, that's T-E-R-U-M-O-B-C-T dot com slash hope. Next, our feature story. Good morning, Daily Sunup listeners, and welcome to a special edition of the Colorado Sun Politics Podcast. I'm Jesse Paul, politics reporter here at the Colorado Sun, and I'm joined by my colleague, Brian Randy Eason. Hey, Brian. Hello, Jesse. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. We've got less than two weeks until Election Day, and I can't wait for this election mania to be over. We're working really hard. And one of the things we decided to do today uh, is to go through your ballot to help folks go through that. I don't know about you, Brian, but a lot of my friends have been asking me to help them kind of navigate the really long ballot in Colorado. We've got 14 statewide ballot measures here in the state. And some of the measures are pretty complicated. It's a really packed ballot. So folks are asking for help, understandably, in kind of trying to navigate everything. So I thought I would save myself my many conversations with my friends and help Colorado Sun readers uh, in the process by creating this edition of the podcast where we're basically just going to go through the 14 ballot measures and explain exactly what they are, what they would do, who's behind them, and provide all the information that you need to know to vote, hopefully. So we'd recommend recommend listening to this edition of the podcast with your ballot in hand. Of course, you can always come back to the podcast or scroll through it if you need to hear something else. And all this information and then some is on the Colorado Suns Voter Guide, which is linked to in the show notes and which you can always find easily at coloradosun.com. So before we jump into the ballot measures, we know that you have a ton of judges on your ballot this year and probably know nothing about them because who has time for that? And Colorado has uh, a way to actually help you navigate that process. It's called the Office of Judicial Performance Evaluation, and it determines whether judges meet expectations or don't for their positions. You can find the analysis of every judge up for retention this year at judicialperformance.colorado.gov. That's judicialperformance.colorado.gov. That website has the 2024 evaluations for all of the judges that are on your ballot. I will save you some time, however, and let you know that only one judge up for retention this year, the Honorable Angela M. Roth in Garfield County, was determined not to meet the performance standards set by the commission. So you can read reviews of all the judges, but again, only one judge on there, Angela Roth, was found to have not actually met the performance standards. Okay, so now on to these 14 statewide ballot measures. We're going to go in order of how they appear in your ballot this year. So like I said, you can go ahead and have your ballot handy while you're listening to this podcast and hopefully uh, just be able to fill it out based on information we're telling you. We're just trying to give you kind of the basic facts here 
of what these things do, who's behind them, how they would work, what they would need to pass. So, Brian, you're first up. Can you talk a little bit about Amendment G, who's behind it, and what it would need to pass? Yeah. So, Amendment G, this is the first of four constitutional amendments that the legislature put on the ballot uh, for this November. And remember, if it's a constitutional change, that's going to take 55% of the vote to pass. Uh, this one would expand the state's homestead property tax exemption. That's the the one that seniors 65 or older qualify for. Some disabled veterans also qualify for it. But the way it's set up today, if you're a disabled veteran, your disability has to be classified as what they call 100% permanent and total by the VA to qualify for the tax break. Now, that's a technical bureaucratic distinction that we will get into, um, but the changes would basically just expand it to veterans who are considered unemployable due to their disability. Um, that'd be about 12,000 more people who get a tax break. Those tax breaks tend to be worth about a little under $600 a year, depending on your local property tax uh, tax rates. And, you know, this one was passed unanimously out of the legislature. There, there aren't really any major political campaigns for or against it. And one of the lead sponsors was uh, Representative David Ortiz, who's uh, a Democrat who, who is also a disabled veteran. So this this issue is really close to close to his heart. Right. Representative Ortiz was actually paralyzed in a helicopter crash in Afghanistan during a deployment there. So as you mentioned, there's not really much support or opposition to it. This is seemingly non-controversial. The legislature, both Democrats and Republicans, support this one. So moving on, Amendment H is the next one that's on the ballot. Can you talk about that, Brian? Yeah, so this one is another constitutional change. Uh, Amendment H would create a new board that would hear ethics complaints against state judges, and they would also have the power to to issue rulings on on those complaints. It would also increase transparency somewhat by by making complaints public once they're they're filed, which was is a change from today, where where very few of these complaints actually uh, become public. So this was put on the ballot by the state legislature, and that's that was in response to this alleged bribery and, and cover-up scandal in which an employee was actually awarded a, a big contract, allegedly in exchange for uh, you know keeping their their mouth shut against about potential harassment. Um, so amid all of that, the study committee came out with a report that found pervasive problems within the judicial department. Employees were scared to speak up about sexual harassment, other misconduct. So this really came about in response to that. And, and one of the big changes it makes is it adds this independent board to the complaint process. As a result, a panel of judges won't be policing their own profession the way that they are now as kind of the final arbiters of these disciplinary complaint hearings. Now, there hasn't been any organized campaign spending on this one. Uh, you know, it passed 97 to 1 out of the legislature. But there are critics of the current process who say that these changes don't really go far enough to make the process truly independent. You know, it it still does leave the existing uh, Judicial Discipline Commission in charge of vetting complaints. And today, most of these complaints are dismissed without a hearing at all. So one of the concerns is, well, are we still going to see that same pattern uh, persist even with this big constitutional change? So as you mentioned, refer to the voters by the legislature almost unanimously, no opposition or support to it. And something that should be mentioned is if you do vote in opposition to this because you do think it don't think it goes far enough, that means you get none of what's in the ballot measure at all. And effectively, it would be sending a message to the legislature to go back to the drawing board and come up with something else. But again, there's no guarantee that the legislature would do that. So what's what's in front of you? It's kind of a take it or leave it type situation for now. Okay, moving on. Amendment I is the next one on the ballot. Go for it, Brian. Yeah, so Amendment I, this is another constitutional change. Uh, it also needs 55% to pass. Uh, you know, and this one would restore the ability of judges to deny bail to someone who's accused of first degree murder. So uh, this was an unintended consequence from a law that uh, abolished the death penalty in Colorado back in 2020. You know, the state Supreme Court ruled that 
As a result of that bill, you know, judges can't deny bail for these crimes anymore. Um, so that's kind of led to judges setting bail at just astronomical amounts. Like there was one case that was like a hundred million dollars. Um, and they're doing that kind of as a workaround to keep people in jail while they await trial. Now, uh, this one passed with, with broad support in the state legislature. Uh, supporters really want to protect uh, victims' families who are worried about, you know, potentially dangerous people being being let out on bail. Uh, but there were five no votes from progressives. And, and, and these are folks who generally just want to see the rights of those who haven't been convicted of crimes protected, right? And, and they also really think we should be reduce, reducing incarceration in general. Now, this one hasn't really drawn any organized campaign spending uh, on, on either side. So, you know, this is another one where broad support from the legislature, bipartisan backers on this one, um, and there hasn't been, you know, uh, enough of a controversy either way to really bring in a lot of a lot of campaign money to this race. Just two things to mention. First degree murder is the most serious crime you can be charged with here in Colorado. It used to be a capital crime. There used to be the death penalty in the state, but that was, as you mentioned, uh, abolished in 2020. And secondarily, it's not like a judge can automatically order there to be no bail. There has to be a, a certain hearing that goes on where the judge says, OK, there's enough proof here that this person committed the crime before they can deny bail to someone. So just a few asterisks on that. Yeah, those, those, those are really great points, Jesse. The next one on the ballot is going to be Amendment J. Can you tell us a little bit about that one? Yeah, so Amendment J, another one that was referred to the ballot by the legislature, it's pretty simple. It would remove the prohibition on same-sex marriages in Colorado Colorado's constitution. It was, as I mentioned, placed on the ballot by the legislature. Some Republicans in the legislature voted against it, but it was pretty overwhelmingly approved by the legislature to get on the ballot. Since it's stripping language, it's different than the other measures. It wouldn't require 55% of voter approval to pass. It would just need a simple majority. And obviously, same-sex marriage is already legal in Colorado and nationally, so this is effectively just a cleanup measure. It's really aimed at protecting same-sex marriage should the U.S. Supreme Court undo its ruling allowing that to happen. There's been a lot of money that's been spent in support of it, but there's really no effort opposing it. All right, next on the ballot is the final one placed on the ballot by the legislature. It's Amendment K. Talk a little bit about it, Brian. Yeah, so this one, again, would take 55% to, to pass because it actually changes the Constitution, doesn't just delete something. Um, and Amendment K, you know, this one was brought by county election officials. And, and the reason they brought it is they say they need a little bit more time to prepare ballots in election years. So right now, some election deadlines are set in state law, but a lot of them are in the state constitution, which makes it so you have to go to the voters to change them. And election clerks say that in practice, the current deadlines leave them only like four days in some cases to put together ballots. And as everyone can see from this bot podcast, they're getting longer, more complex. You know, election officials have to make sure every voter has the right combination of taxing districts and ballot initiatives that they're eligible to vote in. And then, you know, they have to double check them all to make sure they're correct before they get mailed out. It's a really arduous process. And, you know, uh, right now, uh, petitions for citizen led initiatives and referendums have to be submitted three months before election day. Uh, judges also have to file their intent to seek another term by that deadline. And what clerks are really trying to do is just move those deadlines up by a week. And now would start the clock ticking a little bit sooner to start kind of step one, step two, step three, a little bit earlier before they have to send the overseas ballots out. There's not any campaign spending on this one either. Uh, it did pass the legislature 95 to 1. That's overwhelming bipartisan support. And this is one of those just really technical things that, that clerks are trying to get done. They would normally get done through the legislative process. But, you know, these deadlines are set in the Constitution. So you have to have to go to the ballot to, to get them changed. Jesse, tell us a little bit about Amendment 79 now. This is kind of one of the most... Uh, most prominent measures on this this year's ballot. Yeah, so Amendment 79 was placed on the ballot by abortion rights groups. 
and it would enshrine unfettered abortion access in Colorado in the state constitution. So abortion is already legal in the state under state law at any time during a pregnancy. Amendment 79 wouldn't affect that. It would simply prohibit any state or local government regulation from denying, impending, or discriminating against the right to abortion access. Again, that's something that state law already does, by, by, but by putting it in the state constitution, it couldn't be unwound by a majority vote of the legislature. It couldn't be unwound by ballot measure, a statutory ballot measure. So the only two limits on abortion access in Colorado are a 1984 constitutional amendment approved by voters that prohibits public money from being used to pay for abortions and a 2003 law that requires healthcare providers to notify a parent or guardian of a minor at least 48 hours before a child is scheduled to get an abortion. So Amendment 79 would lift the prohibition on public funds being used to pay for abortions, but it would not affect the parental notification law. So the lifting of public funds means two things. One, state employees and local employees who get their insurance through their state jobs would be able to get the get abortion coverage under those plans. It would also allow the legislature to pass a bill allowing Medicaid to cover abortion access. Again, it wouldn't happen automatically. There would have to be a state law passed. And since Medicaid is a 50-50 program between state and federal funding, it might not be totally covered. So there's, there's some questions about how that would actually work. So Coloradans for Protecting Reproductive Freedom, a coalition of abortion rights groups, is the main issue committee behind the ballot measure. It has raised and spent many, many millions of dollars from groups and people in Colorado and from out of state. In support of this, you may have seen their TV ads. They've been working kind of around the clock to get this done. They've, they've flooded the airwaves on it. On the anti side is a group called the Pro-Life Colorado Fund that has raised and spent a fraction of what the proponents have. And the committee is registered to the same address as the Colorado Catholic Conference. And the Archbishop of Denver, Samuel Aquila, gave, I think, like $10,000 to the committee. So this is a pretty religious-focused organization. Since this is a ballot measure that would amend the state constitution, it would add new language into it. It requires the support of 55% of voters to pass. And as you mentioned, this is kind of one of the marquee measures on the ballot this year. There's a lot of eyes on it because it's a thing that that Colorado voters haven't voted on before. And also there are measures across the country that do similar things in the wake of the Supreme Court's decision to undo Roe versus Wade. Yeah. Thanks, Jesse. Um, So there's one more constitutional amendment. This is Amendment 80. What can you tell us about that one? Yeah, and once we get through this one, we're halfway through your ballot, <laughs> just just the statewide ballot measure. So Amendment 80 was placed on the ballot by a conservative political nonprofit called Advance Colorado, and it would place a right to, to school choice in the state constitution. Since it's amending the constitution, it also needs 55 percent of voter support to pass. So a Colorado law passed by the legislature in 1994 already grants students the ability to attend and any public school for free, including neighborhood schools, charter schools, and online schools. It also lets parents opt to enroll their children in a private school or a homeschooling program, and families can navigate a process called open enrollment to send their child to a school school district beside their uh, home district. So while that right is protected in state law, that law can be changed by a simple majority vote of the legislature. And as we've mentioned before, the state constitution, it can only be altered by a passage of the of a ballot measure, and it requires this 55% threshold, which is pretty high. So proponents of it say, look, this is just another way to protect school choice in the state. Opponents of it are really worried that this would lead toward what's known as a statewide voucher, voucher program. So basically where parents who might send their kids to a non-public school would uh, get funding from the government instead of sending their kids to public school in order to be used toward the tuition at a different different place. And so education um, groups are really against this when you look at teachers, unions, public school advocates, and there's significant opposition from those both. There's been a lot of money being spent from state teachers, unions, and public school advocates against this measure. measure. Again, you've probably seen either their TV ads or maybe received a mailer or seen some kind of digital ad. And they're spending millions and millions of dollars to battle it. On the pro side is Advance Colorado, the group behind it, and another nonprofit called Colorado Don. And these are two conservative political nonprofits that don't disclose their donors, but you may have seen some of their advertising as well. 
All right, moving forward, we're now into statutory change land and Proposition JJ. Uh, go for it, Brian. With these statutory ballot measures, quick reminder, you know, these don't affect the state constitution. So they only need a simple majority to pass. That's 50% plus one. Um, and yeah, first up is Proposition JJ. So this one is kind of a sequel to Prop DD from a few years ago. Uh, I'm going to guess most of you do not remember that one. But, uh, you know, back in 2019, voters approved a 10% tax on sports betting operators. It was supposed to raise about $29 million a year. Uh, that money is supposed to go towards uh, primarily water projects, but also a few other things. But then in 2022, the legislature put these new limits on how many free bets these companies could offer customers. And as a result, the the tax revenue went up. Um, so the Taxpayers' Bill of Rights, uh, it requires voter approval for new taxes, but it also requires approval a second time in some cases. Uh, one of those cases is if those tax collections are just higher than what voters were told when they first approve it, uh, or if they just increase faster than the Tabor limit, which is inflation plus population growth. Now, if voters say no, or if public officials don't ask, then those excess dollars go back to taxpayers in the form of Tabor refunds. Uh, So if this one passes, it would mean an extra $900,000 for water projects, uh, but that's also $900,000 less in Tabor refunds that are set to go out next year. That would go up to $1.2 million and then $2.5 million by 2027. The reason that that people want to do this is is the state needs to spend about $50 million a year on water projects to complete everything in in its big water plan. You know, this really wouldn't be enough if prop jj passes to to do all of that uh, but supporters say say it would help now the yes campaign they've raised almost five hundred thousand dollars most of it is money that that came from environmental and agricultural groups uh there isn't really a formal opposition campaign that's that's filed at this point and uh, the referred measure did pass the legislature with with wide bipartisan support which you see a lot of times on these issues that that affect rural Colorado. So just two Democrats and one Republican ended up voting voting against that one. And just something to mention here, this isn't a traditional Tabor refund. So if this measure pa- fails, the legislature put in the ballot measure something that I call kind of a shakedown measure, where folks who were sports bettors wouldn't get a, a tax refund. The tax refund would actually go to casinos and sports betting operators. So the legislature has kind of said, look, if you don't do this, it's, the money might not be going to the place you want it to. So next up on your ballot is Proposition KK. Uh, go ahead and explain that one, Brian. Yeah, so Prop KK would make Colorado one of the first states in the country to levy an excise tax on firearms and, and ammunition sales. Uh, this was referred by legislative Democrats. It would be a 6.5% excise tax, and it would raise an estimated $39 million a year. Uh, And that money would go towards victim support services, things like domestic violence shelters, uh, mental health programs. There are over 200 of these programs across the state, and most of them are run by nonprofits and local governments. Um, uh, Supporters of this say that a lot of them are in danger of shutting down. uh, And the reason for that is that the federal funding source for these programs has been shrinking for years and years and years. And now the state has kind of been keeping it going with with all of the pandemic aid dollars that, that came in from the federal government. But now the state's running out of that money too. So right now, the federal government charges a 10% excise tax on firearms. California recently passed a similar measure to this one, uh, just with you know higher taxes than, than Colorado's measure. But in Colorado and most other states, the only state or local tax that you pay if you buy a gun is is sales tax, right? So there's a group called Colorado Supports Crime Victim Services. They've raised about $75,000 to campaign for this. Most of the money comes from anti-gun violence groups, uh, as well as nonprofit organizations that, that work with victims and would maybe get some of this money. There's an anti-tax group as well that that created an opposition campaign, but it hasn't really reported any any fundraising or or spending. Um, this one was largely a party line vote in the legislature. It, it passed sixty to thirty three, 
you know, and it's generally opposed by Republicans and, and gun rights groups who view it as attacks on lawful, responsible gun owners. Uh, and they don't think it will actually deter those who commit crimes. Um, supporters, of course, you know, see a nexus between guns in general and uh, and gun violence. And, and they think that that the sale of guns and ammunition should be helping folks that uh, that, that suffer from from these crimes. Jesse, what can you tell us about Prop 127? Yeah, that's the next measure on your ballot. And we are now done with the legislative referred measures, just to be clear. Okay, so this measure was placed on the ballot by pro-animal wildlife groups. And basically what it, it would do is ban the hunting of mountain lions, bobcats, or lynx in Colorado. It's already illegal to kill lynx, a species classified as endangered in the state. And it would allow for some exceptions for personal safety, livestock, and property but violating the prohibition would be classified as a class one misdemeanor, and that carries jail and uh, fines as well. So fines would be increased for violators who violate the law multiple times should this pass, and wildlife license privileges would also be on the line for those who were convicted of the crime. There is a ton of money being spent on both sides of this, and it is kind of the second major wildlife control ballot measure on the ballot in recent years. So hunting and firearms groups are really opposed to the, this. They've spent a lot of money in opposition to it. And the Wild Animal Sanctuary in Keensburg is one of the biggest supporters of the measure. They're spending a ton of money to try and get it passed. And since this is just a, a statutory measure, it only needs a simple majority to pass. Again, this was not referred to the ballot by the legislature. It was referred by uh, pro-animal wildlife groups. Okay, let's move on to Prop 128, and this is this is yet another kind of criminal justice effort, right, Jesse? Yeah, so a yes vote on Proposition 128 would require that a person convicted of certain violent crimes, thinking second-degree murder, first-degree assault, kidnapping, sexual assault, arson, burglary, or aggravated robbery, they would have to serve at least 85% of their prison sentence before they would become eligible for parole. It would also prevent them from being eligible for good behavior and other reductions in their prison sentences until they have served that 85% of their sentence. So under current law, prisoners can gain earned time that reduces their time in prison as an, in as an incentive toward progressing certain professional and personal or education goals. And they can also get out uh, after having served up to 75% of their prison sentences when they become eligible for parole. So this would go into effect for people who are convicted of violent offenses after July 1st, 2025, and about 22, 222 people each year are sentenced to prison for these violent crimes, and they are currently serving an average of about 23 years in prison, according to nonpartisan legislative staff. So this measure was also placed on the ballot by Advanced Colorado, the conservative political nonprofit that doesn't dis disclose its owners that was behind a few of those. Um, other ballot measures that we're going to talk about, nonpartisan state analysts estimate that the measure would have a pretty de minimis upfront cost, but in about 20 years when th these sentences would start being elongated, it could increase state spending by between $12 million and $28 million per year due to the longer prison sentences that people convicted of these crimes would, would have to serve. So the issue committee Coloradans for Smart Justice is the opposition group to this measure. It's funded by the ACLU of Colorado and the Colorado Criminal Justice Reform Coalition, so some more kind of progressive uh, anti-incarceration groups. And as I mentioned, Advanced Colorado is, is working on this, and it needs a simple majority to pass. Okay, let's move on to Prop 129, and this one is about veterinary professionals, right, Jesse? Yeah, so this initiative would create a new state-regulated position in Colorado of a veterinary professional associate, and it would also establish its educational requirements. So VPAs would be able to provide veterinary care deemed within their scope, uh, potentially you know, even surgery kind of things, and the State Veterinary Board of Medicine would kind of define the precise expanse of what they would and wouldn't be able to do. So this was placed on the ballot by a coalition led really by the Dumb Friends League. It's the animal rescue here in Denver that, that a lot of folks maybe have, have gotten rescue animals from. And proponents point to surveys showing that there's a sheer shortage of veterinary care nationally and also in Colorado, especially in rural areas where care for large farm and ranch animals is, is kind of a concern. So those wishing to qualify for the VPA position would have to be 18 years old. They'd have to get a master's degree 
in veterinary clinical care or, or an equivalent as determined by the state veterinary board. They'd also have to be registered for the state. So by comparison, vet techs who are kind of the lower level veterinary professional that you might run into when you're taking your dog or cat to the vet generally only have to get an associate's degree while vet tech specialists to step up from that, they have to have some additional uh, training as well. So the veterinary school at CSU, which isn't officially endorsing this or weighing in on it because it's a state entity, is working on constructing the program for the BPA should this pass. Opponents of the initiative are worried that it would not have enough training for people in these positions to perform surgery. And, you know, it's noting that, hey, even routine procedures in a, veterinary's, a veterinarian office can be kind of complicated. So Keep Our Pets Safe is the organization committee, uh, is the campaign committee opposing Prop 129. It has raised a lot of money, both from in-state and out-of-state sources, the Colorado Veterinary Medical Association, the Colorado Association of Certified Veterinarian Tech- Technicians, the American Association of Bovine Practitioners, just to name a few. And I think the money being spent against it is really an acknowledgement that this could f- open the floodgates to similar measures in other states. It needs a simple majority to pass. And as I mentioned before, the Dumb Friends League is kind of leading the support for this. Okay, we've got two more left. So Proposition 130 is the next one on the ballot. Go ahead and talk about that, Brian. Yeah, Prop 130 is a little unusual. It would create a $300 million state fund to help recruit and train law enforcement officers all across the state. Uh, But there's a couple major caveats. Number one, there's no tax increase to do it. So state lawmakers would have to cut other parts of the state budget to pay for it. Two, it doesn't actually say how soon the state has to spend the money. So we could see a situation where they basically set aside whatever they can year after year until it adds up to that $300 million figure. I mean, that could take five years or 10 or longer if lawmakers really wanted to to drag this out. Uh, in addition to creating the support fund, the measure would also establish a million dollar death benefit for families of law enforcement officers who were killed in the line of duty. Uh, this one was placed on the ballot by Advanced Colorado. We've mentioned them before. They're a conservative political nonprofit that was also behind efforts this year to cut property taxes. So they're no stranger to weighing in on on state spending issues. And supporters of this measure say that they're really trying to address uh, police officer and law enforcement shortages across the state. Um, uh, and that's definitely been a problem Uh both in the metro area as well as in as in rural areas that have a really hard time, you know, uh, recruiting police officers uh, to their communities. The other thing is, though, this is just a really significant amount of money, and that's kind of the biggest thing you're going to hear from from opponents. Uh, it would effectively double the amount of general fund dollars that the Department of Public Safety receives today. The state is already faced $900 million deficit that's going to require big budget cuts next year. Um, So if this passes, you can expect lawmakers to really want to drag this out as as much as possible, uh, mostly because it's just going to be really difficult to to take out a $300 million chunk of of the state budget right now. Um, Now, Advanced Colorado, uh, as I mentioned, uh, they don't disclose their donors. They may be spending heavily on this measure. We don't really know. Coloradans for Smart Justice, uh, Jesse had mentioned them before. They've raised about $100,000, but it's not just for this one. It's also for the other criminal justice measure, Prop 128. And all of their money has has really come from two groups. Uh, it's the Colorado Criminal Justice Reform Coalition, as well as the ACLU. Uh, all right, Jesse. Last one and the most complicated one, Prop 131. Yeah, so this is also another big one on the ballot that folks are paying close attention to. So Proposition 131 would transform most of the state's primaries. So candidates from all parties run against each other with the top four vote getters advancing to a ranked choice voting general election. So you could potentially have a race where you've got four Democrats or four Republicans or two Democrats, two Republicans advancing to the general election from the open primary, the all-candidate primary. So it would affect uh, not all of the races, but it would apply to races for Congress, Governor, Attorney General, Secretary of State, Treasurer, State Board of Education, and University of Colorado Regent, 
as well as state legislative contests. It would not apply to the presidential race in Colorado or certain local contests like those for district attorney or county commissioner or city council, things like that. So what's ranked choice voting, you might ask? Uh, Folks would be able to rank candidates in order, one, two, three, four, a preference that they choose. So if your first candidate's not picked, you get to say, hey, I'd like this person second. So if a candidate wins more than 50% of the first preference vote under under ranked choice voting, they are declared the winner. If no candidate reaches that 50% threshold in the first round of voting, candidates with the fewest vote first preference supporters are eliminated, and then their votes are redistributed until uh, eventually one candidate re- gets 50% of the total vote. So Alaska uses basically the same system, and that system was adopted by voters in 2020. It was first used in 2022. There's actually a measure on the ballot there to repeal it. And there's forms of this in other states. California, Louisiana, Nebraska, and Washington also use different versions of the all-candidate primary system. And I I will mention that Proposition 131, if it passes, just needs a simple majority to pass. It would not go into effect right away. And that's because of a clause added to Senate Bill 210. That was a broader elections measure passed by the legislature this year. And that clause requires 12 Colorado municipalities and counties of a certain size with a certain specific demographic makeup to conduct ranked choice elections before a ranked choice uh, election could be held statewide. So just a handful of Colorado cities and towns currently use ranked choice voting in Colorado in their municipal elections or plan to do so in the future, including Boulder, Basalt, Broomfield, and Fort Collins. Aspen and Telluride have used ranked choice voting in the past, but they no longer do. So the supporters of Proposition 131 say it represents a better way to boost voter participation in elections and ensure that every voter's opinion is reflected in the results. That's because turnout during primary elections is often much lower than it is in general elections, meaning that the most partisan candidate often wins. Also, ranking candidates means voters have a better chance of influencing general election results, even if their top choice loses. So Think about being a voter in a decidedly Democratic or Republican part of the state where oftentimes the election is won in the primary and then in the general election you might vote for the other party, but it doesn't really matter because it was kind of decided already ahead of time. Opponents of the system say it is too complicated and will exacerbate conspiracies about elections in a time when there already are a lot of conspiracies about elections. They also argue that Colorado's election processes are already among the nation's best, and that they therefore don't need changing. And election officials have warned that they need time to implement the changes, and so they're pretty concerned about timelines in the measure. Right now it says 2026, but as we mentioned, it probably wouldn't happen for a long time. I think 2028 is a safe bet, given kind of what the governor has said about that clause that he once stripped out, and kind of what where the legislature is at. So critics also point out that the measure is largely funded by wealthy donors, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Colorado Voters First is the committee that leads the charge on Proposition 131, and it had raised uh, more than $9 million through September 25th, and that number has just continued to kind of go up by the day. You've seen big donors from within Colorado and outside of it supporting this measure. The chief proponent of the measure is Ken Theory. He's the wealthy former CEO of the Denver-based dialysis giant DeVita, and the measure has been endorsed by folks like Governor Jared Polis, Senator John Hickenlooper, Denver Mayor Mike Johnson, as well as some Republicans in Colorado like Aurora City Councilman Dustin Svonek and State Representative Matt Soper. Voters' Rights Colorado is the group that's opposing Proposition 131. It's backed by a list of progressive organizations, and it is spending and raising money, however, to a much lesser extent, like fractions of the millions of dollars that's being spent in support of this. The Colorado Democratic Party and Colorado GOP are kind of the lead opponents of the measure, and you've heard them speak out about it uh, kind of in in lots of different contexts. All right. Well, those are the 14 statewide measures on the November ballot. Like I mentioned, you can go to coloradosun.com and read our voter guide. It's also linked to in the show notes. The Blue Book is also another great resource if you need it. You can always reach out to Brian and I with questions about some of the measures that are on your ballot. And also in that voter guide, you'll find information about candidates running in the most competitive races in Colorado. So if you have questions about that or a few of the Denver ballot measures, we're happy to help you there over at the Colorado Sun voter guide. Thank you, Brian, for sticking with me and helping our readers and listeners understand all of these things. And we look forward to 
finding out how you cast your ballot in a few weeks here. Thanks, Jesse. I think I'm going to need some more coffee. Me too. Finally, here are a few stories that you should know about today. Colorado Democrats could unlock new political powers if they win big in November. If Democrats pick up a supermajority, they could refer constitutional amendments to the ballot and override a gubernatorial veto without Republican help. Democrats need just one more seat at the Capitol to achieve that goal. Democrat Tricia Calvaries, who is running against Republican U.S. Representative Lauren Boebert in Colorado's 4th Congressional District, paid herself nearly $14,000 out of her campaign account in July, August, and September. There's nothing illegal about the payments, but it's unusual for candidates to pay themselves a salary because of the criticism it can draw. Representatives from Google, Microsoft, IBM, and other massive technology companies showed up at the state capitol on Monday to show support for Colorado's controversial artificial intelligence law, which became the first in the nation to pass last spring. The law aims to put guardrails on machines that make major decisions that could alter the fate of any Coloradan. For more information on all of these stories, visit our website, coloradosun.com. And don't forget to tune in again next time. Now, a quick message from our team. Hi, I'm Tamara Chung, and I write about business and technology for the Colorado Sun. A large part of my beat is the Colorado economy and covering the ups and downs of losing a job, finding a job, running a business, all that fun stuff. You'll find coverage every Saturday in What's Working, and it's free because we feel all Coloradans need to know this stuff in order to stay better informed. You know, that's how we roll here, by the way. And that's why we'd appreciate your support to help keep the Colorado Sun sustainable. If you'd like to become a member, you can just go to coloradosun.com slash join today. Thanks.